Good evening. Welcome to the University Church of Christ here in Cleveland, Ohio's Wednesday night Bible study for November 16th, 2022. I'm Terrence R. McLean, the ministering evangelist on behalf of my beloved wife, Sister Linda McLean, as well as on behalf of our elders, brothers Frank Barnes, Donald Nelson, Greg Shields, and their families, our deacons, brother Freddie Gibson, brother Anthony Slade, and their families. And on behalf of all of the wonderful members of the University Church of Christ, we welcome those of you who are visiting with us. Whether you're a member of a sister congregation and you've joined in to study with us from God's word, or you are a, an individual who is seeking to better understand God's will, and you're not a member of the Church of Christ that we read about in the Bible, uh, but you want to know more about God's will, you are our special guest, and we thank you for, for joining us. And of course, we're thankful for those members of the University Church of Christ who are tuned in on the, this uh, Wednesday evening, or if you're watching later on Facebook or on YouTube uh, at a different time, uh, we thank you for joining us. We're thankful for those who are on the teleconference call also who have joined us in our study of God's holy and divine word. Uh, before we begin our study on this evening, we are going to uh, make some announcements, read some announcements, and have a word of, of prayer on behalf of prayer requests. Uh, but before I read the announcements and we talk about the prayer requests, I want to remind everyone that the lesson from last week, uh, True Conversion, uh, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, are, is up on our website. Uh, you can get access to the document so you can study it some more. Uh, also, tonight's lesson, which is coming from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verses 9 and 10, uh, entitled Rescued by the Risen Jesus, uh, is also on the website. As a matter of fact, it is on the website already. Uh, those who would like to have access to it as we study along, uh, the website page is at www.univ1885coc.org. Uh, hopefully it will also show up in the comment section. Uh, but again, it's www.univ1885coc.org. And then just click on Bible study and it will take you uh, to a drop down menu. It will show Wednesday night Bible study uh, as well as Sunday morning Bible study. I provided a document a few weeks ago entitled When Rebaptism is Necessary. Uh, for Sunday morning Bible study. That document is there, but also the documentation for tonight's study, uh, Rescued by the Risen Jesus, and also last week's study, uh, True Conversion, both video and uh, the document itself. And of course, you can look down uh, in the drop down menu and see a number of other studies that are available to you as, as well. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, my prayer is that you will be blessed indeed by our time together. Uh, as we uh, read the announcements and let you know about the prayer request uh, for Wednesday, November 16, they are as follows. Uh, our ladies Bible study will be this Sunday, November 20th from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. Uh, we will continue our study of women of the Bible and for members of, of the Lord's Church at the university, the Zoom meeting ID uh, is 847-0768-2569. Uh, again, the Zoom meeting ID for the Ladies Bible Study for Sunday, November 20th for, at 5 o'clock p.m. via Zoom. Uh, the Zoom meeting ID is 847 zero seven six eight two five six nine uh, and the passcode is five two nine four nine two that passcode again is five two nine four nine two 
the period to apply for CMHA Section 8 housing, uh, LLHEAP and free appliance replacement programs are now available. Uh, additionally, if you are in need of or know someone who needs rental assistance, uh, please visit the community board for more information to view other programs that are available when you're at the building. Uh, if you'd like information before this coming Lord's Day, just call uh, during office hours, 10 a.m. until uh, two, 3 o'clock p.m. and that information will be made available to you. Continue to prayers for Sister Mildred Brown, who has been released from the hospital. Also, we're praying for the Cottingham family, uh, Sister Ruth Wade and family, Brother Melvin Flowers, uh, Brother George Felix, Sister Patricia Gaines, uh, Sister Carmel Ivory, and Emma Brown and family. Uh, we have received notice from Sister Phyllis Duvall requesting that she'd like us to pray for the health of her sister, Renee Jackson, who just had a stroke. So Sister Phyllis, we certainly will be praying for your sister, Renee Jackson. Uh, praying for Brother Willie Blackwell Sr., who is in University Hospital at University Circle. Uh, Brother Willie Blackwell Jr. informed me on the Sunday when he was leaving the building that Brother Willie Blackwell Sr. had had a fall and broke his leg and that he was in the hospital, and we certainly want to continue to keep Brother Blackwell Sr. in prayer. Uh, continue to pray for those who have lost family members, requested prayer for their health, and those who will have medical procedures. Uh, remember to pray for all our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters, their families, all those administering to the health and care of our loved ones. Uh, pray for the Church of Christ family as a whole, its ministries, and our spiritual strength in the Lord as he continues to use us, his body, to advance his kingdom. Uh, also continue to pray for the, the leadership here at university, uh, myself as the ministering evangelist, my wife and family, our elders and their families, our deacons and their families, uh, and the entire body of Christ all around the world. And I ask a special prayer for uh, the congregations of uh, the Lord's people and the greater Cleveland area. Uh, pray for the ministers and their families, the leaderships uh, and their families and all of the members of our sister congregations uh, in greater Cleveland and Northeast Ohio, going down to, to Akron, of course, Worcester Avenue, North Hill, uh, going down to Canton, uh, the Southeastern congregation there. Uh, where Brother Larry Battle serves as the minister, going over to Elyria, uh, praying for Brother Eddie Johnson and the congregation at Lake and Walnut, going to Youngstown and uh, Brother Eddie Dunlap and his beloved wife, Sister Michelle, and the membership and leadership there as well. Uh, please continue to keep all of, of us in prayer. Uh, this last announcement that I do want to want to emphasize uh, I did read off that Sister Patricia Gaines is requesting prayer. Uh, we're praying not only for her health, uh, but I do want to remind everyone that her sister-in-law, Ruby Connor, will be funeralized on this coming Saturday, November 19th, uh, at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, that will be at the Avon Avenue Baptist Church, located at 10902. Avon Avenue here in Cleveland, Ohio. Again, Sister Patricia Gaines, sister-in-law, Ruby Connor, uh, will be funeralized on this Saturday, November 19th, 2022 at 12 noon. And those services will be held at the Avon Avenue Baptist Church located at 10902 Avon Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio, 4410. Five. Uh, so let's please not only lift Sister Patricia Gaines in, in prayer, uh, but let's make ourselves available as God's children and her brothers and sisters in Christ uh, to be present, those of us who will be available to be present to support her and her family uh, on this coming Saturday. So with those announcements and prayer requests made, would you bow with me as we go to God 
in prayer as we pray. Uh, of course, I am thankful for my beloved wife, Sister Linda McLean's support and encouragement and partnership in, in ministry. Uh, we want to continue to lift her in prayer with her ongoing uh, uh, doctor's appointments and challenges with health. Uh, but we're thankful to God she is with us uh, on, on this, this evening. Uh, she, is, she is my congregation of one uh, here in uh, our home. Uh, we just appreciate her support and her love so very, very much. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, gracious and eternal Father who art in heaven, you are holy and you are righteous and you are just. Uh, we humble ourselves before you, acknowledging that it's in you we move and live, have our very being. Uh, Father, you've heard our, our prayer requests and our announcements. Uh, we thank you that Sister Mildred Brown has been released from the hospital. We continue to pray for her for uh, the Cottingham family, brother and sister Robin and Christine Cottingham and their family and brother George Felix and uh, the loss of a loved one. Pray for sister Ruth Wade and her family and brother Melvin Flowers and his battle with health issues. Uh, we pray for sister Carmel Ivory and you know what she stands in need of. We continue to lift sister Emma Brown and family before your throne of grace as well. Father, would you be with Sister Phyllis Duvall's sister, Renee Jackson, who just had a stroke. Uh, we ask that you would be with those who are ministering to her medical needs. We also lift Brother Willie Blackwell Sr. into your presence and are sorry to hear about his, his fall and uh, the injury that resulted from it. But we ask you to be with those in the university hospital who are ministering to his medical needs and use them as instruments in his hand, in your hand, uh, to restore him to excellent health and strength. Be with Brother Willie Blackwell Jr., uh, his son and our brother in Christ. Uh, continue to encourage him. We thank you for his uh, willingness to drive the church van on Sundays. And we just ask you to continue to watch over, protect, and keep him. Father, be with those who have lost family members or those who requested prayer for their health, those who have undergone and will be undergoing medical procedures. Be with all of our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters and their families and those who are administering to their medical needs. Father, we pray for the body of Christ, the family of God, the world over, our ministries and our spiritual strength in the Lord. Please continue to use us as your body to advance your kingdom. We pray for the leadership of our uh, brothers and sister congregations uh, in the greater Cleveland area, Northeast Ohio, in the state of Ohio, around this country and around the world. Uh, be with their leaderships, their memberships, uh, be with the ministers who stand and preach and teach your word. Help us, Father, to be unified in all that we do. And we ask a special blessing for Sister Patricia Gaines that you would, first of all, continue to bless her medically uh, as she continues to heal from medical challenges. Also, that you would comfort her as she prepares to funeralize her sister-in-law, uh, Ruby Connor, on this coming Saturday. And pray, Father, that those of us who are members of the University Church of Christ, her church family, will be there to support her. Uh, again, uh, continue to be with my beloved wife. Thank you so much for her, uh, for her faithfulness to you, for her love for you for her support of ministry and partnership in it. Uh, continue to watch over, protect her, and just bless her uh, in the very special way uh, that you see she stands in need of, and that we might continue to help this congregation to be all that you would have us to be in serving you and in saving lost souls. Thank you for Jesus, your son. He died that we might have life and have it more abundantly and we just pray uh, that as we study your word tonight, uh, that I will hide in the shadow of the cross, rightly divide the word of truth, get yourself some glory. May I lift up Jesus that all will be drawn to him. May saints of God be edified. May souls who are in need of salvation have their eyes and understanding open. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Tonight, I want us to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. And again, if you do not have, uh, or if you do have access to the internet, you can go to our webpage and you can get uh, a copy of the lesson to study along with me. Uh, if you don't want to do it right now and just want to study from the Bible with us, uh, you can always get it later. Uh, but we want to talk about uh, the subject rescued by the risen Jesus. And we want to talk about it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and, and 10. If you recall, on last week, we were in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we were in verses 5 through 8. And we talked about the subject of true conversions, true conversions. But tonight, I want to talk about being rescued by the risen Jesus. In verse 9 and 10 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 in the New American Standard Bible 2020, it reads this way. For they themselves report about us as to the kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come from the wrath to come rescued by the risen Jesus in the NASB 1995, where it reads to serve a living God, a living and true God, as well as in the 2020 version, there is a, a little letter there that says some manuscripts have the living and true, true God. But whether we're talking about the living and true God, or a living and true God, there's only one God we're talking about that meets that criteria. His name is Yahweh. In our Bibles, Jehovah in English. One of the things that is important for us to grasp as we study this lesson is this. The Bible declares that the whole world lies in the power of a wicked tyrant called the evil one. That's how he's described in 1 John 5 and verse 19. In John 8, 44, Jesus said of him that he is a murderer by nature, intent on destroying those whom he holds, holds captive. You know, in John 10, verse 10, Jesus had said, the thief comes to kill and to destroy, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more, more abundantly. Paul told, told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and 26 that uh, Satan's desire is indeed to destroy us. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3 and 8. He does that by rescuing people from Satan's domain of darkness and transferring them to his kingdom where they have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. In fact, if you look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 
13 and, and 14. I want you to notice what Paul wrote to the Christians at Colossae. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He rescued us. To be a member of the church is to have been rescued. God uses us, his people, as his commandos to go into enemy territory with the powerful weapon of the gospel to liberate those who are being held captive by the evil enemy. The Apostle Paul made one such commando raid into the city of Thessalonica or Thessalonica. He came under enemy attack but was able to rescue some. His daring mission set the city into an uproar. They accused him and his co-workers as being men who had turned the world upside down in Acts chapter 17 and verse number six. He was forced to leave town after just a few weeks, leaving these newly liberated people to face the angry opposition of those who were content with the evil regime. A short time later, he wrote them a letter, which we know as First Thessalonians. He begins by thanking God for what he had done in the hearts of these people and by commending them for the example of their transformed lives, which was being spoken of everywhere in that region. That's what we studied, studied last week. You know, what does it look like when, when our lives are, are truly transformed? And he had talked about the fact that they have become imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word during great affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that they became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Achaia. And that in every place, the news of their faith toward God had gone out. So that Paul said, we didn't need to say, say anything. So there, there was some evidence of, of their transformation. But then before Paul could say a word to people, people would tell them, how they had turned to God from idols to serve a or the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. He rescues us from the wrath to come. So in verse 9 and 10 of 1 Thessalonians 1, we learn that the risen Jesus rescues from the coming wrath all who believe in him and turn to God. And so in these verses, as we study, there are three vital lessons I want to leave you with before this study is over or when this study is over. And the first one is this. Number one, there is certainly a wrath to come. Number one, there is certainly a wrath to come. Now, I will admit that the idea of God's wrath and judgment is not popular in our day even among those who profess to be Christians. Many would rather tell people that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their lives. Many downplay the notion that God is angry with them because of their sin and that they face horrible eternal punishment in hell if they die without being reconciled to God. 
if we were honest, most professing Christians and or members of churches would admit that the notion of God's wrath and eternal punishment is a bit embarrassing. So many, quote, preachers, unquote, dodge it and promote the gospel as a great way to have a happier life. I want you to think about it. Much of the preaching that you hear via the internet, on television, on radio, for those who still have it, on podcasts, much of it is about how we can have a happier life in the here and now. But in so doing, they misconstrue the biblical gospel and they water down the biblical picture of salvation as God's rescuing us from certain destruction. It becomes more like starting a new diet or exercise program guaranteed to make you feel better right away. But our text shows us that the certainty of God's wrath to come rests on the very character of God. Paul declares that God is the living and true God and that Jesus rescues us from the wrath to come. He further describes this coming wrath in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, where Paul says, quote, and this is from the New American Standard Bible, 2020, the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. I want that to sink in. Oh yes, Jesus is coming back with his mighty angels. But he's coming back in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The King James Version, which is, of course, the one I'm most familiar with. I've been studying it for 50 years. And most older Christians really are, especially among African Americans, we're very familiar with the King James Version. But he basically says the same thing. And to you who are troubled with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from Kevin with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. During his earthly ministry, Jesus Christ spoke more about the awfulness of God's judgment than any other person in the Bible. Were you aware of that? He described it as a place of outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth in Matthew 25 and verse number 30. He calls it in Mark 9, verse 48, a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not extinguished. In Mark chapter 9, verse 42 through 45, Jesus said that it would be better to cut off one's hand or foot or even to die by having a millstone 
stone hung around one's neck and being cast into the sea than to go into hell. We may not like these words, but if we deny or dodge them, we are not following Jesus who repeatedly taught this awful truth. I want you to picture this in your mind. The crucifixion of Jesus on the cross of Calvary uh, was much more horrendous than it's usually depicted in the movies that, that we see. The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's version of the last week in Christ's life, uh, really was pretty graphic, and yet it doesn't come close to the horror of what Jesus went through. But when we stop to think about the fact that what he went through was in order to make sure the wrath of God did not come down upon those who would be willing to believe in him, it really makes sense. You see, sin in our day and age is just not considered as bad or terrible as it once did. But God's judgment's coming. And God's wrath is not like human wrath. Human wrath is usually an outburst against something or someone that frustrates us. Occasionally, human wrath may be quote, righteous indignation, unquote. But even when we say our wrath is righteous indignation, it is tinged with our fallible propensity toward selfishness and misunderstanding. It's also tinged by our tendency to sin. But God's wrath is his holy, settled, active opposition toward all evil in line with his absolute motive of all motives and circumstances. If we do away with the concept of God's wrath, we also then do away with his holiness and justice. Many people make the mistake by thinking that they will escape God's judgment because they are not like the evil terrorists of the world. They think, I'm a decent church-going American. I pay my taxes and obey the law. I don't beat my wife and children. Sure, I've got my faults and I'm not perfect, but I'm not an evil person. I don't need to fear God's judgment. But our text indicates that there are only two kinds of people. Those who have been rescued by Jesus from God's wrath to come and those who have not. I want to repeat that. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whenever you're listening or watching this study, you are in one of two positions. You are one who has been rescued by Jesus from God's wrath to come, or you are one who has not been rescued by Jesus from God's wrath to come. So that brings me to the second point under number one. Letter B is all who have not been rescued by the risen Jesus are in imminent danger of the wrath to come. By nature, we all tend to look at our own works or at what we consider to be our good intentions and we think that we're good enough for heaven. But the Bible is clear that no one gets into heaven by his or her own efforts, his or her own good works, or his or her own good intentions. Our problem is that we compare ourselves to the wrong standard. If we compare ourselves to other people, we may come out on the right side of the curve. But God's standard is his absolute holiness, beginning on the thought level. 
as Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, if you've ever been angry with someone, you're guilty of murdering God's sight already. If you've ever lusted after a woman, you're guilty of adultery. Matthew 5, verse 21 and 22. Matthew 5, verse 27 and 28. Both sins make you guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Matthew 5, 22 and Matthew 5, 29 and 30. You see, man in his attempt to get away from God's standard of holiness and righteousness has devised these, this hierarchy of sins, little sins, big sins. But I want to remind you that it was all sin that put Jesus on that cross. Let's assume that you are an unusually good person. You've only chalked up on the average one sin of thought, word, or deed per month since the time you were five years old. If you talk back to your mother once that month, the rest of the month you had nothing but sweet, loving thoughts toward her. If you selfishly demanded your way, you only did it once that month and did not at any other time think in a selfish manner. And at this record-breaking rate of righteous living, you will have chalked up 840 sins by the time you are 75. Can you imagine going into a court of law and pleading, Judge, I admit that I've broken the law 840 times, but I'm far better than most people, so you should let me off. How much less does anyone, even the best of us, stand a chance of acquittal based on our good deeds when we stand before the holy God whose standard is perfection. The Bible declares that we are all by nature children of wrath because of our, of our sin. In, second, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And by the way, we are studying from the book of Ephesians in our Sunday morning Bible study. So uh, we studied some of this a couple of weeks ago. And you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. Ephesians 2 warns us that the wrath of God abides on all who do not obey the Son of God. In John chapter 3, verse 36, the Bible says, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now, I want you to notice in that verse, the first thing he says is the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So the Holy Spirit has believing in the Son that gives e eternal life equivalent to obeying the son. In other words, if I don't obey the son, I don't believe the son. I can't claim to believe the son and not obey the son. Jesus did not come to earth and die on the cross just to help you live a bit more comfortable and happy life. He came to rescue you. He came to rescue me from the wrath to come. 
if he has not rescued you, then you are in imminent danger of that wrath. It is imperative that you understand how you can be rescued while there is still time. So point number one, there is certainly a wrath to come. Point number two is this, to be rescued by Jesus from the coming wrath, we must hear the gospel, believe it, obey it, and turn to God from idols. Letter A, to be rescued by Jesus from the coming wrath, we must hear and obey the gospel. Paul mentions the kind of reception, literally the entrance that he had with the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. We read about it in Acts 17 verses 2 through 4 where it says that Paul went into the synagogue on three successive Sabbaths and reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Some believe that message, but the majority opposed it and formed a mob to set the city against Paul. The gospel or good news that Paul proclaimed may be summarized as follows. All of us have sinned against the holy God, thus incurring his wrath. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So since all of us have sinned against the holy God, thus incurring his wrath, God could justly condemn us all to hell because Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is, is death. But being a God of great love and mercy, he sent his own eternal son, Jesus, into this world to bear the penalty that we rightly deserve. He had to suffer death, which is the penalty that God imposed for our sins. Again, Romans 6, 23. And God accepted Jesus' sacrifice as evidenced by the fact that he raised him from the dead. God's justice was satisfied in that Jesus paid in full the penalty for our sins. And Romans 3.26 says he can now be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You cannot be saved apart from hearing and understanding that message. Let it be, to be rescued by Jesus from the coming wrath, we must believe the gospel. Hearing the gospel must be accompanied by faith, Galatians 3 and verse 5. The Thessalonians had received the word, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, with faith toward God, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 8. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Contrary to popular opinion, biblical faith is not a blind leap in the dark. It doesn't mean setting your brain on the shelf and believing a bunch of old Jewish fables or legends. Rather, biblical faith is based on the testimony of eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, teaching, death, bodily resurrection, and ascension into heaven. Now, granted, we cannot, quote, prove, unquote, unquote, these truths in the same sense that we can prove that two plus two equals four 
And so there is the need for faith, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But it is not an unreasonable or blind faith in that the evidence is trustworthy. We believe the testimony of men all the time about everything else. I don't know that there was a man that lived named George Washington. I accept that by the testimony of historians. I've never seen Abraham Lincoln. I accept that from historians. I wasn't there when there was a revolutionary war, but I accept the testimony of historians. But we have the testimony of God concerning his son that is greater than the testimony of any historian who has ever lived. As a matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 9, the Bible says this. If we receive the testimony of people, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. The one who has the son has the life. The one who does not have the son of God does not have the life. So we have the testimony of God. When Paul first preached in Thessalonica, he pointed to the evidence of the scriptures concerning Christ's death and resurrection in Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. No doubt he took them back to Psalm 22, which describes in detail a death by crucifixion centuries before that mode of execution was known on earth. He probably took him back to Isaiah 53, which predicts with great detail the suffering and death of God's Messiah, when according to Isaiah 53 and verse 11, when he will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Both of those texts also imply the resurrection of the crucified Messiah when God will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, Isaiah 53 and verse 12. Paul may have also pointed to Psalm 1610, which predicted that God would not allow his holy one to undergo decay. That's repeated again in Acts 13, verse 34 and 35. It's also repeated in Acts chapter 2 when Peter preached the first gospel sermon, when he quotes from Psalm 16 that the Lord would not allow his body to see decay. So he had the testimony of God himself. But leaving this message is not just ascending to the facts as presented in scripture and by the eyewitnesses. Biblical faith, listen to me closely. Biblical faith involves an active commitment in which we renounce all trust in our own good works to save us from God's judgment and a total entrusting of ourselves to Jesus as the only Savior from God's wrath. Genuine saving faith is inseparable from repentance, which means turning to God from our sins, which then leads to confessing with the mouth 
that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, which in turn leads us to being baptized because of what we say we believe. Let us see. To be rescued by Jesus from the coming wrath means we must turn to God from our idols. Before these people, before these people had hoped that their idols would placate God's wrath. But once they heard the gospel, they threw away their idols, turned to God alone and trusted in Jesus' death on the cross to rescue them from their sins. The word turned occurs often in the book of Acts to describe the proper response to the gospel. Paul described God's commission to him as opening the Gentiles' eyes, quote, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, Acts 26, 18. He sums up his preaching as telling people, quote, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance, Acts 26 and 20. In other words, if I say that I have repented and I have turned away from idols to God, then there ought to be some behavior, some actions in my life that indicate that I truly have turned from idols toward God. There are other verses, Acts 9, verse 35, Acts 11, verse 21, Acts 14, verse 15, Acts 15, verse 19, where it talks about this same concept and again, you can see it on our website, doc, download the document. Uh, not only did I tell you earlier our web page, uh, but it's, going, it's showing up right now in the comment section of this Facebook post. Now, maybe you're thinking this is all very interesting, but I am not an idolater. I don't bow down or pray to any statue, so this doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. But the only choices are you either serve God or you serve idols. You either serve God or you serve idols. An idol may be a literal statue. I, when I was preparing this lesson, I even went online to see if I could buy an a idol anywhere in the Cleveland area. And I was amazed at the number of places where you can literally go buy a little god of some kind to put on your mantle, but we don't do that because we know at least it's obvious that's wrong. But an idol is anything that usurps the rightful place of the living and true God in your life. I wanna repeat that. An idol is anything that usurps the rightful place of the living and true God in your life. At the root of all idolatry is the God with a little g of self. Many people leave this God with a little g on the throne and then they try to use Jesus to get what self wants such as happiness, health, wealth, love, or many other things. But if you leave self on the throne and then use Jesus as an Aladdin's genie, it is not to turn to God from our idols. The Thessalonians did not just add Jesus to their existing pantheon of idols. They trashed their idols and turned to the living and true God alone. Listen, you can even make religion an idol and put it before the living God. How often do I talk to people about salvation and the need to 
respond in a humble obedience to the gospel of Christ. And the first thing they want to say to me, well, I got my own church. That's the problem. It's yours and it's not the Lord's. We can't even make religion an idol. For Jesus to rescue you from God's wrath to come, you must agree with God's judgment that you have sinned against him and that you deserve his wrath. You must understand and believe that God's son Jesus came to earth, paid the penalty on the cross that you rightfully deserve. Genuine faith is not just agreeing mentally with these facts, but also turning from all of your false gods to the only true God. If you have done that, your life will be demonstrably different. Everyone could see the dramatic change in the Thessalonians. Paul mentions two things that stood out after they turned to God from their idols. And this brings me to point three. Those who have been rescued by Jesus submit their lives to God and wait expectantly for Jesus' return. The word translated serve comes from a word meaning to serve as a bond slave. To serve as a bond. Now, remember what he said in verse number nine of 1 Thessalonians 1. How you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. To serve. A bond slave was not free to do whatever he pleased. If the bond slave wanted to go to the beach, he couldn't tell his master, I'm taking the day off. See you tomorrow. How many of us treat God like that? Even when it comes to assembly for worship on Lord's Day, you know what? I don't feel like today. Lord, I'll see you next week. Hmm. The bond slave belonged to his master and lived to do his master's will. In our case, our master gave his life to rescue us from certain doom. Thus, we do not serve him out of bare duty or obligation, but out of gratitude and love. And thankfully, he's a loving and gracious master who has our best interests at heart. Serving him is not drudgery, but a delight. But not only do we serve him joyfully, we also eagerly look for his return from heaven. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are uh, many rooms, the New American Standard Bible says, King James Version says, are many mansions. If that were not so, I would have told you because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you also will be. We who have been rescued from God's judgment by Jesus long to see his face. Later, Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Those whom Jesus has rescued from the wrath to come submit to him as master and eagerly look forward to the day of his coming. Those whom he has not rescued live for themselves and don't give much thought to the day of his coming, which for them will be a day of wrath and judgment unless they repent. Listen, my friends, God is a holy God who must judge all sin. If he doesn't judge all sin, then he's not a just God. He has given due warning that he is going to judge this world. But he has not left us without a means of escape. He's given us his son, Jesus. And as the writer of Hebrews asks, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews 2 and verse 3. Believing in Jesus is more than giving mental assent to the fact that he lived once upon a time. But it means that you take seriously his warnings about the coming judgment on this wicked world so that you trust him totally as the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father, John 14 and verse 6. I know, I know this topic is not what you would call uh, popular in our day and time. I know it's not one that's going to get you want to jump up and shout and say hallelujah because nobody wants to hear about the fact that a judgment is coming. But God must judge, judge sin. God must judge sin. And, and as I close this, this study and extend the invitation, all of us are familiar with the story of Noah's Ark. How God had looked down upon man and how that the very heart and thoughts of man were wicked continually. And God decided he was going to destroy the earth. But he found one man, Noah, who found grace in the sight of God. And, and God gave Noah instructions to build an ark. And in this ark, anyone who went in that the preaching of Noah would be saved, and one who did not go in would be lost. The flood that was coming was actually the wrath of God on the sins of mankind. And yet God gave Noah instructions on how to build an ark of safety that would protect everybody and every animal that went in from the wrath that God was going to bring because of man's sin. What a mighty God we serve. God could have very easily left us to ourselves. The judgment that's coming is coming because of our sin, since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Since, as he said earlier in Romans chapter 3, there's none righteous, no, not, not one. Everyone is in need of deliverance or rescue. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You've heard truth today. The gospel is about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You've got to believe that gospel message. And Jesus said himself in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And where I am, you cannot come. 
we've already talked about it throughout the lesson that when you really believe that he is your savior and and lord it leads to repentance changing our mind changing our will changing our action in fact acts chapter 17 verse 30 paul said that those on mars hill that they needed to repent even of ignorant worship for he said and the times of this ignorance god winked it but he now commands all men everywhere everywhere to repent it was jesus who said in luke 13 3 and 5 i tell you nay but except you repent you shall all likewise perish and then we confess with the mouth that jesus christ is god's son romans 10 9 and 10 that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and believe in thine heart that god has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved but with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation and then we're baptized for the remission of our sins. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Saints of God need to be restored in their walk with God. Come back home. Come back to the assembly of the saints. And come back to living your life on a daily basis in fellowship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God wants you, when you obey the gospel, when you're restoring your walk with him, to worship him in spirit and in truth. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23 and 24. We do that worship on the first day of the week. Every first day of the week. Like the Thessalonians, you have heard that God has pronounced wrath to come on this world. You have heard that he sent his son Jesus to die for your sins and that God raised Jesus from the dead. He is coming again, either as your savior or your judge. Believing that message, you obey the gospel and place your eternal destiny totally upon the risen Jesus. If you will do this, Jesus will rescue you from the wrath to come. Thank you for joining us. For all of you are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. Whether you're a Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you and I am your servant for Jesus' sake. Bow with me as we close to God in prayer. Gracious and eternal Father who art in heaven, thank you for this day, for the opportunity to share a thought from your word. And Father, my prayer is that everyone will be rescued by the risen Jesus, saved from their sins and your wrath that's coming upon mankind because of sin. Father, our prayer is that you would bless every person uh, many individuals have asked for prayer, even in the comment section of uh, this, this Facebook posting. We pray, oh God, that you would bless them with the things that they stand in need of. I don't have all of the requests right before me, but I have seen them as they have scrolled down. You know what we all stand in need of? Not only do we need rescuing from the wrath, of God to come, but just to live in this world, we, we need you. We need your grace and your new mercies every day to meet the challenges that life places before us. So would you answer these and all other prayer requests that may not even have been turned in, but where individuals stand in need of you moving in their lives, especially the saints of God. And Father, we ask you to touch those who need rescuing from your wrath because of their sins. My prayer is their eyes have been opened, that they will see your love that calls you to give your son, his love that caused him to give his life. That in fact, you loved us so much that because you are just and righteous, you have to judge sin, but you made a way for that judgment upon our sin 
to be placed on your son in our stead. Watch over us as we leave this platform. We are mindful that we're never out of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen.